Hello, my beautiful What the Psychology family. So I have made you wait long enough. So I'm sure you know by the title what we're going to start talking about today. I'm really excited. I had done some extensive research on this. I'm finally able to give you a good quality episode. I will let you know that. So... I'm sorry that I have been super busy lately. I know I have been pretty sporadic on when I post episodes, but y'all, this girl is crazy, and this girl is sometimes a little lazy and busy. (laughs) So, um, okay, so I do want to give you some updates about the podcast in general. So, I feel like I have finally made it because they say that once you get your first one star review, that's when you really made it. (laughs) And I just received that two days ago and I've made posts today about it because, you know, at first I was very discouraged about it and then I figured, you know, looking at my numbers, I know I still have like 34 listeners per episode. And I know I've gained a few more followers and they're starting from the beginning. So the numbers outweigh it. Honestly, I'm definitely not letting it get to me. It's whatever. Haters are gonna hate. And that's all I gotta say about that. I do want to shout out a special member because I found out that I now have a monthly supporter. Which means they're donating money to help me keep this thing running. And even a dollar helps. Like, I was never really expecting to monetize this. But, you know, if people want to donate, it does help. um, Because I do spend a lot of time on this. And hopefully I'll be able to upgrade software one day or something. So I just want to shout out. I really hope that I pronounce your name correctly. I'm sorry if I don't. But um, I wanted to shout out Amelia Del Greco for... Being a monthly supporter, I greatly appreciate it. Especially after getting that one star review, it really just shows me that, you know, I do have people that like what I'm doing. And honestly, that's all that matters. I feel like I'm going to continue going through life and there will be people that like me and people that don't. So I greatly appreciate you and I appreciate everybody else that does listen. And Amelia, I wanted to let you know that if you ever want to private message me and I can send you a sticker or a bunch of stickers for being a monetary supporter of mine. So I do have monthly support if anyone wants to contribute on Anchor, but I also have it on Patreon. Patreon is set up a little different, like you get a little treat or something, you get merch if you subscribe on there, but I'm making it to where if you do it on Anchor, well, I'll send you like a sticker or something anyways, that way it's kind of fair. So I just want to give you guys a heads up about that. Also, if you want to go on Apple, or um, especially Apple, because it's where I see a lot of my reviews, and give me a good review just to outweigh that one bad one, that would be greatly appreciated. But I want to thank you guys for listening, and you know, hey, things happen, and that's just a part of life, right? We're going to have some people that like us and some people that don't. On another note, before I get into how my week was, I do want to let you guys know since it is Thanksgiving week, I will be going out of town, so this will be the only episode this week. I'm sorry, it kind of accounts for both last week and this week, but just want to give you a heads up, and then, I don't know, maybe, especially once the fall semester ends, then I can really focus on getting this content out to you on time, and then maybe even some bonus stuff. Alright, so now let me tell you about this week. I went to see Corey Asbury in concert. He's a Christian artist. I went with a friend that was amazing, had such a great time. And then Saturday, my husband and I went and saw the musical Hamilton, which is like my favorite. I am obsessed. I can't even talk about it. I've even talked about to some of my friends that I will have a Hamilton quote on my graduation cap. So... We shall see which one I choose. Uh, let's see. Other than that, this week has been crazy busy. Our friends from Guatemala did leave last week, which was really cool on the day they left. 
it we actually had some snow here some snowflakes and none of them have ever seen snow so it was such a cool experience for them augie got a haircut the chief editor uh so he is looking spiffy and handsome i will post a picture also he's got a little thanksgiving turkey bandana on so super cute he is ready to go out of town with me so let's get right into it i am your host kay gonzalez and you are listening to what the psychology Alright you guys, so today we are going to focus on Charles Manson, his early childhood, and antisocial personality disorder. So we are going to start shifting more towards that, but um, I wouldn't say this is the end of the cult series. We'll probably still go over some other cults in the future. The possibilities are really endless, honestly. So we first need to talk about personality. We did talk about narcissistic personality disorder and I did fail to actually give you a definition of what the differences in personality disorders are versus like psychological disorders or as we know as mental disorders. Well, this is a type of mental disorder but it's much more permanent than something like depression or anxiety like depression and anxiety they can be permanent but you can work through them and kind of improve them whereas personality it's like an individual's character and their pattern of thinking feeling and acting there's so much more to it and it's really hard to describe the difference so i'll do my best here let me dive in and explain this a bit because it it might help so first things first personality. It's an individual's characteristic pattern of thinking, feeling, and acting. It is defined by a set of traits that capture the defining character of a person. So they are prominent behaviors and those characterize a person's behavior. These are things that are internally based. They are relatively stable so they are similar across different situations. And there are a lot of different theories about personality, which that is something we can get to another time. Personality disorders, they involve long-term patterns of thoughts and behaviors that are unhealthy and inflexible. When it comes to personality disorders, typically the person doesn't know that they have a personality disorder. Like when it comes to narcissism, they think they're too good to have a disorder. So... But other people can pick it up. Other people can see it. They lack traits that are normal. So um, like personality traits, I should say, that are normal. Which will, which it really depends on the personality disorder. When it comes to narcissism, they lack empathy. They are very self-absorbed. They think others are envious of them. They think they deserve special treatment. So those are all traits character traits and it's really hard to change those not saying that it's impossible but it is really hard (laughs) so behaviors that these people with these type of disabilities personality disorders they have their behaviors they cause serious problems with relationships and with work people with these disorders they have trouble dealing with everyday stresses and problems They also usually have stormy relationships with other people. However, the cause of personality disorders is unknown, but there has been a lot of research and they think genetics comes into play a lot, childhood experiences, social factors, things like that. Like I said, the characteristics and the symptoms of each personality disorder are different. They can be mild or severe, so it really just depends on how severe it is if they can work through it. People with these disorders, they may not realize they have a problem because they think it's normal. They think that their thoughts are normal and they will often shift the blame to others for their problem. A lot of narcissists definitely do that. 
They may try to get help because of their problems with relationships and work. But they're not trying to seek help for having a disorder. It's because they are having issues. They're trying to get help for that. Now, treatment for personality disorders usually does include talk therapy and sometimes medicine. So there are ways to kind of work through these. But it really depends on how severe, you know. And that goes with a lot of different disorders too that we've talked about. Maybe not personality disorder. We've talked about schizophrenia in one episode, and in some cases, people have to be on medication or they will just have psychosis. So, it really depends on the severity. So, let's talk about antisocial personality disorder. So, this is a mental condition in which a person has a long-term pattern of manipulating, exploiting, or violating the rights of others without any remorse. They have no remorse, no empathy, or anything. This behavior obviously can cause problems in relationships or at work and oftentimes is criminal because they violate the rights of others. They don't care about other people. They will take what what is not theirs, whether that's a sexual matter, whether that's theft, whether that's taking a life, etc. Now, a big point, and it's quite ironic, is that antisocial does not mean that you are not social in this context. I know that's very weird, but it does mean that those with this disorder, they don't possess the traits to have a healthy social interaction with people. They are pretty much devoid of or even antagonistic to sociable instincts or practices. So I hope that clears that up a little bit because when I first... (laughs) And I feel like a lot of people have that misconception. They think, oh, antisocial, they are very shy and to themselves and things like that. When they can have those traits, but that's not the defining traits. The defining traits is that they have no remorse. They can't properly interact because of manipulation, exploiting, and having no remorse. So I know I had that misconception. So I hope that clarifies what it actually means. Causes of antisocial personality disorder is unknown, but with research, they do say that a person's genes and other factors such as social interactions, especially in childhood and development, they can contribute to that condition. So if there's child abuse, people that have antisocial or an alcoholic parent or at an increased risk. Also, far more men have it than women. So remember, we started that tally a while ago. Yay, women! This one is not common in us, but men, mm, mm, gotta watch out for y'all. So this condition is very common among people who are in prison. And that's not to say every single person that is in prison, but a lot of them. There are some signs, and we hear about these all the time, but I am going to reiterate those. Usually setting fires and animal cruelty during childhood are often seen in the development of this personality disorder. If there is head trauma or head injuries, those can be a causation, especially if they are at a younger age because it's a disruption in their cognitive development and their brain development. So... That's also another commonality that you hear about. Some other doctors, they do believe that psychopathic personality or psychopathy is the same disorder. But others believe that psychopathic personality is similar but more severe. So there is some argument about psychopathic personality, antisocial personality, but... A lot of people do relate to antisocial personality disorder or it's also called sociopathy or sociopath. They argue that that's less severe and that psychopathy is more severe. But it's just up for debate. A lot of people with this, they do consistent. Remember, these are consistent things. They show no regard for right or wrong. They ignore their rights and the feelings of others. They tend to antagonize, manipulate, or treat others harshly or with callous indifference. They show no guilt, no remorse, no empathy for their behavior. They often violate the law, 
They become criminals. They may lie, behave violently or impulsively. They have problems with maybe drugs and alcohol. And because of these characteristics, people with this disorder, they typically cannot fulfill responsibilities related to family work or even school. Some of them can have a lot of charm. Like Charles Manson, he was very charming. They can use their charm or their wit to manipulate others for their own personal gain or personal pleasure. They can be arrogant and have a sense of superiority and be extremely opinionated. They can use intimidation and dishonesty, be callous, cynical, and disrespectful of others. Um, they may be very impulsive, fail to plan ahead, have hostility, significant irritability, agitation, aggression, or violence. They take unnecessary risks or they have dangerous behavior with no regard for the safety of themselves or other people. They they also are consistently irresponsible and they repeat failing to fulfill work and financial obligations. So adults that have this disorder, they typically show symptoms of conduct disorder before the age of 15. Conduct disorder does include serious persistent behavior problems such as aggression towards people and animals, destruction of property, deceitfulness, theft, serious violation of rules. Now, although that antisocial personality disorder is considered a lifelong thing, like I said, in some people, in certain symptoms, particularly destructive and criminal behavior, those can decrease over time. But there is debate about what decreases that. Is it the result of aging Especially, you know, your brain ages as well. Or is it an increased awareness of consequences of their behavior? But that's debatable because it's whether or not they realize the consequences. But I guess if they go to prison a lot and they hate prison, then they'll be like, oh, I acted this way. I guess if they do it enough, then they can finally connect the dots. There was one study that I read a long time ago and for the life of me I could not find it when I was doing my research into this but I do remember that it said that an adolescence or antisocial personality disorder almost 50% was genetics and I wish I could find that and cite it but I remember reading that I had to do a project on it and that's insane other things that can put people at risk is having abuse and neglect during childhood and also having like an unstable violent or chaotic family life during childhood. These people they could have homicidal or suicidal behaviors. They could have other mental health disorders. They could have low social and economic status and homelessness because of their failure to maintain their obligations. They could have a premature death, usually as a result of violence. Those are consequences of those with this disorder. Also, obviously, like being in jail, being in prison, those type of things. Prevention, there is no sure way to prevent it, especially for developing. But they do have a lot of the warning signs that we talked about. So it might be best to identify those that are most at risk, such as children who show signs of conduct disorder, and then offer intervention. That's probably the best way to prevent this from fully developing. Charles Manson, we will get into um, when he was diagnosed with this. But I'm going to talk about his early childhood because I am not going to be sympathetic towards Charles Manson, the older Charles Manson. But baby Manson or young Manson, with his childhood, it's it's we just have to take it into account because it can contribute to his development of this. So I hope you guys understand where I'm coming at from that angle. It's only because those are causations of this disorder why I think it is important to go over these. So Manson, he was born on November 12th, 1934 in Cincinnati, Ohio to his mother, Kathleen Maddox. She was a 16 year old girl who was both an alcoholic and a prostitute. 
Initially, Charles Manson did not have a name. He was actually named No Name Maddox. His name eventually was Charles Miles Maddox. His father was in the army, and as soon as he found out that Kathleen was pregnant, he fled. So, I don't know if she got pregnant due to being a prostitute or if they were married. So, his father was a colonel in the army. His name was Walker Henderson Scott Sr. Funny how he had another child and he abandoned this one, but whatever. He was an army man. He was stationed nearby when... Kathleen told him that she was pregnant. He fled the area and he never returned. So it is very likely that young Charlie Manson, whatever we want to call him, that he never actually met his father. A lot of this information about his childhood I'm actually getting from a website called charlesmanson.com slash childhood. So in case you ever want to look up what I am talking about here. Kathleen later met and married William Manson, and that's where Charles got his new last name from. However, the marriage did end pretty quickly. William Manson, he was an alcoholic. He would be gone days at a time. And so was his mom, Kathleen. She would continue to drink, and she would neglect Charles. Charles Manson, he was placed in a boys' school at the age of 12. In 1939... So this is when Charles was like five years old. His mom was charged with robbery. She was sentenced to 10 years. And so Charles was sent to live with his aunt and uncle. However, his mom was paroled in 1942. So she was only in prison way less than her actual sentence. Charles, he did try to return to his mom after she got out. But she continued her abusive parenting habits. And that's when Charles started to have his own issues. And like I said, his mom, she would drink and neglect him. She would hang out with strange men. Who knows what kind of trouble she was getting into. His mom sent him to Gilbot for Boys in Indiana. It was a school for juvenile delinquents ran by Catholic priests. Yikes. I don't trust anything with Catholic priests. Like, no offense to Catholics, but your priests get a bad rep. And I know that's not all of them, but yeah. (laughs) We also know about the abuse of Catholic priests and nuns with rulers and smacking kids with those and things like that. So yeah, I've I've also heard horror stories about Catholic schools, but that's kind of another conversation for another day. Other people have had good experiences, but you know, it's, it's what it is. So that school, Manson, he actually ran from there twice. The first time he was returned... And then the second time, he actually ran off to Indianapolis, and he was caught stealing. So, like, mother, like, son. The judge that he had was very sympathetic because he was fairly young. And he sent him to guess where. He came to Boys Town in Omaha, Nebraska. (laughs) Which is where I'm at. Yeah. I don't live far from there, so it's kind of interesting. I didn't know that until I conducted my research, so it's crazy to think that he was here. So while he was here in good old Omaha, (laughs) he was caught for more robberies and sent to Indiana Boys School, which Boys Town and Indiana's Boys School, all the places he's been to are for juvenile delinquent. And... Okay, I'm going to go off on a tangent here. Some of these schools are really, I think nowadays they are a lot better than they were back in Manson's days. Nowadays they focus more on rehabilitative measures, but back then it was more like a prison. So while he was at Indiana Boys School, Manson does claim that he was beaten and raped there. And he failed to escape twice. And then on the third time, he finally did escape in 1951. While he was on the run, he had more thefts and more robberies, and he was apprehended. From there, he was sent to the National Training School for Boys. Poor guy, he doesn't get to see any girls. (laughs) That's really bad to say. Um, That was actually in Washington, D.C., and that's where he was first evaluated for psychological issues. 
He was deemed to be aggressively antisocial. And remember what antisocial means. It's not like what it sounds, right? So upon recommendations from the physicians there, he was transferred to the Natural Bridge Honor Camp. Um, before his scheduled parole hearing set for 1952, he was caught raping another boy at knife point. Holy cow, y'all. And he's a young boy. He's not even 20 yet at this point. Like, guys, that's 18 years old. That's pretty much an adult, but barely an adult. Phew. That's disheartening. He was already acting out on his antisocial tendencies. So from there, he was actually transferred to the Federal Reformatory in Petersburg, Virginia. There, he was caught committing several homosexual crimes against other boys. So, what does that mean? It says homosexual crimes. It doesn't say rape, but I'm assuming that's rape, sexual assault. But you have to remember back in this time, I don't think that being homosexual was legal so it could have just been that but it does say homosexual crimes against other boys so to me i'm assuming that he was raping or sexually assaulting other boys uh from there he was transferred to a maximum security facility in ohio he was released in 1954 at 20 years old so he didn't even spend he only spent like a couple of years in the maximum security which is insane. He was technically an adult raping other boys or other adult boy, adult men, whatever. Lordy. So he was released to his aunt and uncle. And by that time, his childhood had officially ended. Now, <clears throat> in 1955, he did marry a local waitress named Rosalie Jean Willis. They were married. I don't think they were married for too long. He was actually able to hold down employment and have a quiet life. He then convinced his pregnant wife, Willis, to move to Los Angeles. However, he stole a vehicle to drive them out west. <laughs> he got caught and he was sentenced to three years at Terminal Island in San Pedro, California. During this time, his wife met another man and planned to divorce him. Once he found out, he tried to escape. Uh, luckily, he was caught and lost his chance at upcoming parole. And what's scary about that is he tried to escape once he found out. So who knows what his plan against Rosalie were going to be. When he was released uh, for prison, he began pimping for a living and was caught forging a U.S. Treasury check in the amount of $43. And I don't know how much that was worth back then. But he was arrested and given a 10-year suspended sentence and probation. So then he moved with the woman he was pimping to New Mexico and was again arrested and charged in Texas for violating his probation because he moved across state lines. He was then sent back to L.A. to serve his 10-year sentence, which had been suspended on the basis that he does not violate his probation. In July of 1961, he was transferred from the Los Angeles County Jail to the United States Penitentiary at McNeil Island in Washington. On March 21st, 1967, he was released from prison and moved to San Francisco. Let me see. So, 1967, and he was born in 1934. So, he was 33. So, this dude spent 33 years of his life being abused and neglected to start off with. Um, and then put into schools, have acts committed against him, go to more schools, commit acts against people. It's just crazy how, like, what, how did he develop this is my question. And I don't have enough background on his biological parents to know if they had this condition either. Uh, let's see where we're at for today. So, of course, a lot of us know that San Francisco is where things started. This is where he formed the family, as known as the Manson family. The family, quotes, was a group of around a hundred followers of Manson who shared his passion for an unconventional lifestyle and habitual use of hallucinogenic drugs such as LSD and 
magic mushrooms. And there is an official name for magic mushrooms called Psydelics, I believe. I'd have to look up. They did move from San Francisco to a deserted ranch in the San Fernando Valley. My question is, why does everything start in San Francisco? (laughs) I mean... The Manson family started there. Jonestown started there. Like, what What the heck is going on? (laughs) Manson's followers, they included a small, hardcore unit of impressionable young girls. Um, Like I said, Charles Manson was very charming. He also wanted to be a musician. He did have a talent and a knack for music. He seemed really nice. He seemed very charming. And he actually, a young Manson, he was not that bad looking. But he had, like, a lot of people that start cults, such as Jim Jones. They, he had his believers. They started to believe that without question that Manson was Jesus. And, uh, because that's what Manson claimed. He, he claimed that he was Jesus. And he had prophecies of a race war. I'm going to tell y'all, there is no prophecy in the Bible that another human will take form of Jesus and that there will be a race war that's not a thing. So, uh, (laughs) it's just not. I do have this really cool picture that I will post. It has fun facts about Manson. I want to read those off real quick because I don't want to get too deep into the acts today because that will just take too long. I love you guys, but it would take way too long. All right, I'm going to read this and post it. Charles Manson, cult leader. He was a cult leader whose followers carried out brutal murders in 1969, including the slaying of a pregnant actress, Sharon Tate. If you didn't know that, now you know. (laughs) He did misinterpret the Beatles' Helter Skelter as a call to incite violence. After four decades in prison... He died in 2017, so a few years ago. So, some quick facts here. He had 100 followers. He believed in Armageddon. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. He claimed to be Jesus, wanted to be a musician, and he never actually killed anyone himself. He never actually took a weapon and committed the act. One quote from him is, Look down at me and you see a fool. Look up at me and you see a god. Look straight at me and you see yourself. And that's from biography. We're going to talk a little bit more into this. And Armageddon is a Christian type revelation principle. So I will talk more about that. So Manson does claim that he was influenced not only by drugs, (laughs) but by artworks and the music of the Beatles song Helter Skelter. Now, Helter Skelter was from their 1968 White Album. And later, the Helter Skelter, The True Story of the Manson Murderers, was later the title of a best-selling book about him and his crimes written by Vincent Bugliosi. (laughs) Paul McCartney, who is a Beatle himself, has said that the playground slide in the Helter Skelter was a metaphor for the rise and fall of the Roman Empire. Has nothing to do with race. (laughs) But, you know, Manson misinterpreted the lyrics. And he thought that it meant that there would be a start of a race war. He turned to the album and the lyrics to justify his scheme and guide his followers to murder. He was using something that he could blame. Okay. He was going to blame it on this song, on the Beatles. You have to remember, part of their personality is they think that they do no wrong. They don't have empathy. They don't have remorse. And could that take a step of misinterpretation and trying to put the blame on something else? Possibly, because they are manipulated. Uh, He had a strong belief and interest in the notion of Armageddon from the Book of Revelations. Uh, We will get into that here in a bit. I want to read through the rest of this And then we'll discuss it because that might take more time. He also explored the teaching of Scientology and more obscure cult churches, such as the Church of the Final Judgment, which, by the way, are not actual churches. They, like, Scientology is a cult. 
church or final judgment is a cult. So they take religion and they, it's just like Jim Jones, they take religion and they turn it into their own warped thing. Yeah, pretty disgusting, right? So his reflected personality traits and obsessions that were associated with these type of groups, those started to emerge in the 1960s. And he was pathologically deluded into believing that he was the harbinger of doom regarding the planet's future. So he reflected in thinking that Hemus himself was God. A very interesting connection that Manson did have was to the Beach Boys. This was before he went or before he manipulated anyone into murdering anybody. He was actually friends with Dennis Wilson of the Beach Boys. And he allowed Manson and several members of the family to stay at his home after picking up two female members of the family who had been hitchhiking. It was through this association that Manson did get the opportunity to audition for Terry Melcher, who was son of Doris Day, and he was a friend and producer of the popular 1960s band, The Beach Boys. They were actually living at Polanski's house at the time. Melcher wasn't really interested in signing a contract with Charles Manson, though. He did record some music at Dennis's brother brother's house, Brian Wilson. The Beach Boys did release a song written by Charles that was called Cease to Exist, but they renamed it Never Learn Not to Love, and it was on their 1969 album, 2020, as a single B-side. Now, the murders and the victims, we will talk about that next episode. According to the Book of Revelation, which is in the New Testament of the Christian Bible, Armageddon is the prophesied location of a gathering of armies for a battle during the end times, which is variously interpreted as either a literal or a symbolic location. Now this, the term is also used in a generic sense to refer to any end of the world scenario. Even other religions have taken this and have turned it against their own thing. Even in Islamic theology, they have mentioned it in the Hadith as the greatest Armageddon, or al Malhama al-Kubra, the Great Battle. Uh, most traditions in the Bible prophecy, they do believe that there is a symbolic of the progression of the world coming to an end. And this is when God would pour out his holy wrath against unrepentant sinners. And they would pretty much be manipulated, led by Satan in a literal end of the world final confrontation. Armageddon is just a symbolic name given to this event, which is based on scripture references regarding that obliteration. So, uh, I mean, it's just the way people take this and the way they try to understand it and, and believe it and change it and warp it. It doesn't make any sense. There was a Christian scholar named William Hendrickson, and this is something that he writes that I want to read. For this cause, Har Megedon is a symbol of every battle in which, when the need is graced and believers are oppressed, the Lord suddenly reveals his power in the interest of his distressed people and defeats the enemy. When Sennacherib's 185,000 are slain by the angel of Jehovah, that is a shadow of the final Har Megedon. When God grants a little handful of Maccabees a glorious victory over an enemy which far outnumbers it, that is a type of horror Magadan. But the real, the great, the final horror Magadan coincides with the time of Satan's little season. Then the world, under the leadership of Satan, Antichrist or anti Christian government and anti Christian religion, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, is gathered against the church for the final battle. And the need is greatest when God's children, oppressed on every side, cry for help. Then suddenly Christ will appear on the clouds of glory to deliver his people. That is Har Magadan, which is another word for Armageddon. <laughs> so I uh, hope that doesn't confuse you. I hope some of that made sense, but he's taking this belief and skewering it. He's saying, one, that he's Jesus, and he wants to start a race war. But that completely misinterprets what the Bible says. And he was also taking ideas from other cults, <laughs> which we know never ends well, right? 
So, <clears throat> what else can we talk about? And we'll talk more about how he infiltrated his plan to try to start a race war. A lot of those were with the murders that were committed. That's as far as I'm going to go today. Uh, I hope you gained some understanding about this personality disorder, about a younger man, some of the things he went through. 